and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Oliver Sweet, Ali, who is in London in the UK. How are you doing, Ali? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. And uh Ali is a a very fascinating, a business anthropologist who offers an unfiltered view of people and culture through international research. He educates companies and governments on how to change consumer and citizen behavior. Uh, Your work has spanned over 35 countries around the world where you've worked on topics such as public health, sustainability, product innovation, and brand development. Um, so let's let's just start at a very baseline here. So um, for a lot of our audience, um, you're probably the first, you know, in fact, you are the first, the first person who'd come on who is a business anthropologist. So could you just explain that term to the audience? Absolutely. There's not many of us around, actually. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you, a lot of people go into university and they study a degree like anthropology or sociology because they think it's going to be really interesting. And then you come out at the end of three, four years and you're like, what do I do with this? Well, there's a hope for a small amount of us <laughs> who want to apply our skills of academia to the world of business. So anthropology is there to look at culture, look at what people do. And brands and services sit within a culture. So if you can influence that culture, then you can essentially influence how your brand is seen. So you think about a brand like Coke or Nike. These are iconic brands because they have a place in culture. When everybody sees these brands, they know exactly what they stand for. If someone offers you a Coke, you know exactly what that means. If someone offers you a cup of tea in the UK, Mm -hmm. everyone knows what it means. And it's being able to play around with culture and try and get your brand to fit into a different part of culture, essentially. So the world of anthropology essentially means sending me around the world to, you know, hang out in people's homes to look at what people do and understand why people do it. Uh, it, it it's that's absolutely that's uh, absolutely fascinating. And I guess, I mean, take it from even the um, your home country right now in the UK. I mean, even within the UK, right? You have you know, it's a very multi ethnic, multicultural society. There's a lot of. Uh, so within 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 a society like that, I guess then you go even deeper, do you? I mean, there's different ways that different groups within that society react to things. Exactly. Um, it's all about sort of finding the subculture, if you like. So um, at any different point, people are doing things in different ways. And we've often heard this term, you know, people live in their echo chambers. Mm-hmm. And someone's echo chamber is basically, you know, what, an online tech company has defined as a group of people that might be the same. So they serve you the same adverts. Actually, it's just a subculture. And people live in subcultures all around the place. And you feed off your subculture, right? So Mm -hmm. if I am an Arsenal fan up in North London, then I have a, a, a group of people who repeat the same things back at me. So we go to the football, we go for a beer after the football, we have a chat about you know work and life and those kinds of things. If you're not into football, you're not, into, you're not an Arsenal fan, you're not part of that subculture. You don't know about what's going on latest transfers and therefore you don't catch up in the same way as well. So what we try to do when we do research for businesses is first of all, we try and define who their target audience is. Mm. And then we treat that target audience as a subculture and we go and spend time with them to try and understand them. Yeah, because I mean, that's very different because let's face it. I mean, a lot of ways we do it today is we just identify a target buyer with kind of at a very very high level it, they share these couple of traits right and they're they're pretty vague otherwise um so you you're taking this down some levels right because i mean they the thing is like people struggle all the time with identifying their target audience and they can identify it, as i said at a quite a vague level but when you start to dive down they get all a bit com- it all gets a little muddy there, there's a there's a rather amusing example that's used a lot in the UK. Now, apologies if you know this, but I want you to imagine a a man. He's he's a baby boomer. He's born in sort of the late 1940s, 1948. Um, he brought up in the UK, uh, quite wealthy, quite famous, in fact, married twice and lives in a castle. Can you imagine who that person is? Some people say... 
Some people say King Charles, and you'd be <laughs> absolutely spot on. But the problem with that is you could also say Ozzy Osbourne, and oh. you'd also be spot on as well. Right? <laughs> so demographics just don't tell us enough. What you need to do is you really need to get beyond the kind of basic market research data about where they live, whether they've been married once or twice and when they were born. And you need to start looking at their motivations. So why do they want to do certain things? Right. So if you were to ask Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> and King Charles, you know, their views towards authority, for example, mm -hmm. then you might start to see some quite different different attitudes uh, and different different subcultures i'm sorry because mm -hmm. their motivations to behave in certain ways and to show off in certain ways and to use brands as markers of showing off right then you start to see king charles and ozzy osborne is quite different <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i can imagine the the osborne's and the windsors yeah that'd be quite a funny um combination <laughs> um but <laughs> So, so that I mean that clear that clearly I mean that great that's a great example because that clearly shows you that if you have defined at a very high level, then you have two people who are they're identical. They're okay, you target buyer that's identical. But like you said, when you drop down, they're they're different. They're different subcultures. So, when you work with companies, how do you actually how do you take that kind of information and and make it actionable for them? It's a really good question. So. Um... The world of market research is basically frames everything that I do. And the world of market research is about 95% sort of just data, right? Mm -hmm. We're great at analyzing large data sets. And to be honest, you can get so you can get some good stuff out of data, but you never really get why people are doing things. So the next sort of tranche of like research is focus groups and interviews. And that's not bad. That gives you that gives you a sense of meaning. So mm -hmm. it gets you a sense of why are people doing things and what does a product mean to people? And that's really the most important thing. So, for example, I might work with a, 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 a an, an alcohol company, a drinks company, mm -hmm. and I might identify a group of people who um, like to drink particularly high end premium spirits. And I need to understand what, what those spirits mean to them. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do it, really, the only way to do it is to go to the point of meaning. Where is the brand created? Now, I'm a big believer that a brand isn't created on a brand manager's desk. A brand is created in the hearts and the minds of the person who consumes it. Mm -hmm. So I need to go to the place where that brand has meaning. So a, 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 a premium whiskey, for example, it might be bought in a shop, but the brand is created in a bar somewhere mm -hmm. or the brand is created on, you know, on, on a business flight or in a, in a, in a particularly high end hotel or something like that. So I need to go to those places with those people to see how people interact with the world and what they're trying to show. Um, because ultimately all of these things about, are about sort of tapping into people's identity. We're complex people and we like to signal and show things all the time. That's what culture is about. It's all about signaling and showcasing certain things. And if we can get a brand like a whiskey to do that, or we can get, you know, we can buy a certain car that showcases, um, you know, who we are, then that then that works for us and that brands can work with that. Um, is it, is it, there's a, there's a, I do a fair amount of work in automotive research as well. Right. And I've, I've always seen something quite amusing. And that's when I go to someone's house and I can see that they bought a particular car, a Ford or something. And uh, and I know they're part of a particular subculture. I can walk up and down that street and that street might not have, I don't know, f more than about five or six different types of car there. No. Right? They'll all be pretty similar. Go to a different part of town, a different group of people, different, different uh, subculture. Again, completely different set of cars, but also quite a small variation. Mm. So we buy cars like the cars that are surrounding us, even though we think when we buy a car that we're buying it based on our budget, based on our family size, based on how fast we want to go, based on these kinds of things. Right? We kind of just got a herd mentality, even when it comes to a big ticket purchase like a car. Wow, that's um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that that's fascinating. Um, 
Uh, that that is actually really fascinating. I must check that. I must do that exercise myself. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it it's really it, it's it's very it, it's fascinating. So like you said that um what what has there anything changed like since like covid and stuff have have your research have you noticed anything in in changing in in consumer or buyer behavior um because one of the things that we were seeing a little bit more of was like the swing back towards more relational wanting to have some connection to things um because we're finding especially in the tech space right i mean um, brand loyalty is very transactional these days. I mean, people will switch for a. Uh, oh, yours is a dollar cheaper. I'll take that. Okay, yours. Oh, you can. Uh, yours. That one comes in green, and this one doesn't. I'll, I'll take that. There's, you know, when it when it comes to purchasing, every brand wants to create an emotional connection with you, right? They want to have some tra- it's something that goes beyond something that's transactional. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in COVID, so many of those things were lost. Yeah. And so I've done a lot of work in the in the beauty care world mm-hmm. and makeup and fine fragrance just dropped off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> and frankly, it never quite recovered again oh. because our personal aesthetic, our personal style uh, has just changed. Right. Um, interestingly, you know, uh, the, the, the manner in which a lot of our personal care routines take place, that's all changed as well. We started to brush our teeth at different times of day. Uh, all of these things. So, so those kinds of things changed a lot. Um, but one thing we definitely, definitely saw is that, you know, those echo chambers that I was describing, those digital yeah. echo chambers, they actually started to become physical echo chambers because, something like 56% of the UK were working at home during the pandemic and they never really went back to a Mm -hmm. full office life again, which meant that they never really had to do very much outside of their community. So that subculture in that community became their whole world, right? They didn't start to see very much difference at all. Mm -hmm. So a brand or a service now has to come to them Right. So if I've traveled to work, I'm exposed to advertising. I'm exposed to new shops, new stores, different people that give me different opportunities. And now everything has to come to where I live. So one of the the biggest fast food chains in the UK, Pret-a-Manger, right, had famously had just like littered central London. I I remember standing at a -a Pret-a-Manger in Charing Cross outside it and looking one way and seeing another Pret-a-Manger and another way and seeing another Pret-a-Manger. It's three within uh, that I can right. see. They're that close together because they used to take that much traffic at lunchtime. They've deserted central London and they've come all the way to the to the outskirts of London to go back into where people live, to go into mm. the suburbs. But nobody's using them. Right? Nobody's using them because nobody wants a quick lunch at home anymore. If you want a quick yeah. lunch at home, you don't go out to Pret-a-Manger, you go to the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there are lots of services like that that are just really, really trying to redefine who they are to people. Right? We yeah. haven't really thought about what lunch means to us in a new sense, whether yeah. we go to the office or whether we come back. I mean, a little bit maybe, but Pret-a-Manger have had to completely redefine that. And there's, so there's lots of services, there's lots of brands, there's lots of like personal care routines that have just had to change quite a lot. Yeah, and you know that's 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 really fa- that's really fascinating because that's one thing you wouldn't have really like thought about. But yeah, I mean it's obvious. You know, when people work at home, they're not going. Oh, I'm going to run over and stand in a line um, to get my lunch when I can, you know, throw something in the microwave. Um, but it's so. So how how then are um, you said okay? So they moved out to the suburbs, which was, um, but that hasn't worked for them. Like so, how how are brands and and companies going to adjust to this new reality? Because one of the things that certainly here here in the states, um, and I track it back to even to the financial crisis. Is I think that was one of the first times when people started to go, you know, something. I'm not going to locate myself in a high cost place to be near an office or to be or relatively near an office. I commute two hours a day. Uh, when when there's a downturn in the economy, guess who gets let go? And then I'm stuck in a high cost area. With, so people are kind of ele- are, are choosing where they want to live first before they decide where they want to work. And I think that's a that's a big change. It's, it's a huge change. Um, 
one of the things we're always on the lookout are is is for it's kind of cultural changes mm -hmm. or uh, cultural trends, if you like. And we run at Ipsos, we run an enormous uh, global trends survey that actually we can pull data from and then go and do ethnographic studies on those topics. So a couple that we've seen. So one is called uh, our trend is called you know the search for simplicity and meaning, mm -hmm. and that's because overall lo so many people in the world are starting to feel that the, the world is just too fast and too complex yeah. and actually what we want to do is we want to go back to a simple life so we can go and live you know in a smaller town because we can work remotely from there we can put our phones down for a while mm -hmm. we can not upgrade our phones you know the tech world is going crazy for this because people just aren't buying new phones mm -hmm. as quickly as they used to because yeah. the old phones are great right it's simple enough so we're searching for simplicity and we're searching for meaning all the time another big one that we've seen is uh the search for um authenticity mm -hmm. and authenticity is a bit of a fat word it can mean lots of things to lots of different people but when you go and look at what it means in different places you start to see you know how it ladders down so authenticity in the uk is from a cultural point of view is also about finding a bit of a bargain right, right. so it, it's about the process as much as the product so there's a whole and I, like i said I, I do lots of work in the beauty care space and with fine fragrance and there's a whole movement a cultural trend on dupe culture so you can go and find a copy of the fine fragrance that's made by someone for much cheaper mm -hmm. and they advertise it as the same fragrance as Dior. So they say that Dior will retail at, you know, $80 yeah. a bottle, but our perfume is retailing at $20 a, a, a bottle and it smells just like Dior. And people are buying it, not secretly, people buying it with pride. So mm -hmm. dupe culture allows people to be proud of hacking the system. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, a UK version of authenticity is king is the fact that we like to hack the system that gives us pride right it's not just that i've got a, a bargain it's that i'm allowed to tell people i've got a bargain huge problem for brands huge huge problem mm -hmm. for brands because essentially that people have realized that brands are selling at a premium amount and that's a problem so brands are having to like go back and find their own authenticity what is it about that brand that no one else can deliver on and that's hard that's hard that's through an emotional connection with a brand where a brand really stands for something that nothing else stands for um, yeah, no, that's 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 a really fascinating, a, a really fascinating you know trend because at the end of the day, a lot of obviously high end luxury brands or whatever they're they're high end luxury brands because that's what they say they are, that's what they've always said they are, and people have, um, you know, and and they've attracted the right kind of people to reinforce that. Um, but what you're talking about now is that's the big change is actually being proud about finding the cheaper alternative exactly exactly and this is what we're looking for when we are doing research like what are people proud of um again i spend so much time going into people's homes and uh you can ask someone to as soon as you walk in you say oh wow your home is wonderful uh how long have you lived here you know and you just prompt them with one or two questions mm -hmm. and people will go off and tell you so much about their home and our homes are a point of pride and we put things on the walls that are a point of pride right i've got lots of things on the wall that um are pictures that my kids have done because yeah. they you know they are, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of them mm -hmm. and what i've done is i've then you know bought into services where i can take a picture on my phone and then you know a few taps later it goes off as a postcard to my grandmother or to my right. mother or other people like that right i they, they've tapped into my pride um iphone have done this amazing thing that i've only just discovered anyway but um my phone the the home screen changes every hour for a new photo that's on my phone so mm. suddenly i'll look at my phone to pick it up because i need to do something and i'll see a picture of my kid i haven't seen for like three years and suddenly i'm incredibly you know i'm incredibly emotional all of a sudden which is wonderful for my 
you know, for my brand affinity yeah. towards my phone, because suddenly my phone is a much closer and more personable object, essentially. Yeah, wow, that's you know that, that that's absolutely fascinating. And so, where just in the in the last couple of seconds here, where g- give me another trend that you see that you think is just starting that's going to accelerate. Well, one of the other ones that I've been monitoring, um, so it hasn't just started, but I think it's still in its infancy. Is this idea of peak globalization? Mm. I think a lot of places in the world are, you know. Bringing and, and the reason I think it's just in its infancy because it's coming into so many different parts of business and politics and society. In that, actually, in politics, we're starting to close our borders a little bit more than we ever did before because fundamentally, we don't feel the benefits of opening our borders anymore. Mm-hmm. In the UK, we 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 you know we voted for Brexit partly because we felt that there was a problem with lots of people coming in. Right. We're also seeing it with brands. We're seeing so many British labels stamped on stuff because actually, we want stuff that's made in the UK. Um, and this idea that the benefits of globalization are not like yeah. coming back to me, it's a huge one. And we're only just in its infancy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I, I think you're 100 percent correct on that one. And I think uh, I think people have seen, unfortunately, that, you know, the the over promising of globalization hasn't delivered for for the local people. And I think that's where you're they have seen that that awakening right now. Listen, Oliver, this has been fantastic. All of Oliver's information will be below the video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and the organization you work for. So um, I'm a business anthropologist and run a, a, a team of anthropologists. There's about 25 of us in three different continents. Um, the company I work for is Ipsos. We are, I think, the second largest research agency in the world, and we've been ranked the most innovative research agency for the last four years. Uh, we deal in market research of all different kinds. Uh, we have a website. We have LinkedIn sites, all of those things. So if anyone's curious about what we do, there's tons of information online. Uh, if you go to the Ipsos website, and if you want to look up my particular expertise, it's in ethnography, and we can uh, talk about ethnography if you get in touch on LinkedIn or elsewhere. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, thanks again, Oliver. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon. Thank you.